Morning, everybody. Um, thanks for coming. My name is Eamon O'Toole. I work in the in HP's Swift team, and uh, this is my colleague Mark Seeger, um, who works in um, HP's Cloud Services Performance team. And we're going to talk today about um, benchmarking Swift and some measurements on Swift. So, Mark, do you want to go ahead? Okay. Thanks, Eamon. Um, yeah, we're, um, I'm hoping that everybody who at least went to the show last night had a good time and are bright, bright eyed and bushy tailed and ready to hear all about something as exciting as benchmarking. Um, basically, the, 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 the uh, presentation is divided into two pieces. I'm going to talk about benchmarking, and Eamon's going to provide some, uh, some data from some case studies that we had worked on together. And the one important thing. I think about benchmarking to keep in mind is there's at least two major kinds of benchmarking. One kind of benchmarking is someone's got an existing system and they just want to say how fast can it go or how well does it perform under different loads. And you run a set of tests and you generate some data and you present some plots and graphs and whatever. And quite frankly, I don't get all that excited about those kind of benchmarks. The kind of benchmarks I get more excited about is when you run something and it maybe doesn't behave like you expect it would behave and you want to know why, or it runs pretty well, but you want to see if you can make it run better. And, and to do that is a lot more involved, and that's kind of the benchmarking stuff that I, that I want to talk about. And again, Eamon will be showing some results that were based on that kind of a methodology. So I, I have what I would call my benchmarking Bible, and for anybody who's Anybody who's ever done benchmarking, this is kind of something everybody already knows. But for those who may not have done a lot of benchmarking, it may not be as obvious as, you know, every one of these bullets may not be as obvious as you may think, although you certainly may be aware of some of them. You know, one of the big things with uh, benchmarking is repeatability. If you're in a set of tests, and then you run off and you tell the world, look at the results I got, and then somebody else runs a set of tests and gets totally different results, and then you realize, oh, I better rerun them again, but you know, this was this quick script I threw together and now I don't have the script anymore, so I really can't run it again. And the more that you script, the more you can repeat. And again, benchmarking is all about repeatability, repeatability. The um, other important thing about benchmarking that again, some people miss, is they say, okay, I wanna know how fast Swift goes. So I'm just gonna run a whole bunch of Swift tests and we'll see what's going on. And this applies to anything, by the way. I'm gonna run a bunch of tests and I'm gonna generate a whole bunch of numbers. But wait a second, if you get poor numbers, are those poor numbers because Swift was bad or misbehaving? Or was it bad because your disk was misbehaving or your network was misbehaving? You know, you've got this great big stack starting all the way down at your hard drive into your disk controllers, into your network stack, into your, you know, your object servers, your proxy servers, your network switches. I mean, there's a lot of, there's a lot of piece parts in here. And it's really important that you make sure that the lowest levels of the stack are behaving properly before you move up, move up the food chain. Again, obvious to a lot of us, sometimes people forget. Also, there's caches everywhere. You've got caches in your, in, your, uh, in your disk controllers, you've got caches in Linux, you've got caches in a lot of places. And cache effects can skew the results. So if you were to run like a 10 second run, you might wind up measuring how long it takes to get data into the disk controller but not to the drive or into the Linux cache but not out the network. And you can't really entirely eliminate that, but when you run a longer test run, it tends to reduce the impact of those cache effects. And, and this is one of my particular hot buttons. I claim that the middle of the test is just as important as the whole test. Somebody turns around and says, well, I just did a test on Swift and I got, you know, 8,000 IOPS. Well, that's cool. Um, could it have been more? Did you get a steady 8,000 IOPS during the entire duration of your test? Or did you have some spikes at 20,000 and some valleys at 20 and stuff in the middle? And again, I believe it's really important to see what's going on throughout the duration of the test. Uh, yeah, one of my favorites is this one about changing more than one thing at a time. A lot of times people get really anxious something isn't behaving correctly, and they'll say, you know, we better put in more memory, we better upgrade the operating system, we'll change so many system tunables, you know, we'll, we'll make a whole bunch of changes, and then if things work better, it's like, damn, I wonder why. Uh, and you really don't know. Um, maybe it's really important to understand the impact of individual changes. 
And again, this is the one that management hates to hear. It's going to take as long as it's going to take. You know, you might think it's going to take a week or a couple of days, but, you know, sometimes you, you, you discover problems or you, you, find, you find yourself going down paths you weren't planning on going down. So you just keep slugging along. And also another really key thing is there's really no such thing as a coincidence. A lot of times you run a test and there's some anomalous behavior in the test and, and two or three things kind of correlate, but you want to write it off to a coincidence. And you, more often than not, it's not a coincidence. I would also claim that size matters, at least, at least in the case of SWIFT testing. You know, we've basically got large objects and small objects. And on the one hand, they're kind of sort of, you know, an object is an object is an object. But if you think about it for a minute, if you're doing large objects, you have a very, you tend to have a very low number of IOPS and a high uh, throughput rate. Well, the problem is if you're trying to do a lot of large object puts or gets, you're, you're really tying up a lot of network bandwidth, and you may not have that bandwidth available to you. So again, these are some of the kind of things you have to take into, consider into consideration when you're doing your testing. And another thing that turns out was, a, I had mentioned earlier, sometimes you get surprised and you go in different directions. One of, the, one of the big surprises I had when I was doing some of my Swift testing was I discovered that the Swift client for large objects is actually CPU bound. And that was like totally something that never even occurred to me. You'd run, you'd run a test on a, on, a, on, a, on a single core VM and you'd see the CPU load on the VM go up to 100% while you're trying to do a large object put. And again, this took me down a whole different path. And if you start doing profiling and stuff, it's like, oh my God, it's spending all its time doing SSL encryption. And you put in a faster CPU, it still has to do the encryption, but now it has a little bit more time left over to kind of do the I.O. itself, and you will definitely see a performance improvement with faster clients versus slower clients. And that was totally counterintuitive to me. Small objects are a little bit different because now you have a lot of IOPS. And if you're doing a lot of small object puts, you're, you're spending an awful lot of time updating containers and talking to container services. And Eamon's going to get into this a little bit in, in a few minutes, but it's, it, it's pretty interesting. And Again, network bandwidth is probably less important because if you want to do hundreds of one kilobyte puts, you're doing a couple hundred kilobytes a second. That's not a big deal. And of course, the CPU requirement is lower because there's less encryption because there's less data to have to encrypt. Okay, um, just a couple words about Collectal. Uh, this is a tool that I had written a number of years ago that does benchmark that, that I use for doing um, you know, performance monitoring in clusters and things. And this gives you the ability, it, it's another one of these, you know, think of like IOSTAT or TOP or PERF or NETSTAT or whatever. It, it, it's a tool that allows you to look at in real time what's going on in the CPU, the, the disk, the network, et cetera. And the one thing that's kind of cool for our purposes, it allows you to look at process statistics. And furthermore, it lets you look at the process I.O. statistics. And by being able to look at the process I.O. statistics when you run some tests, you can then say, you know, I've got a whole bunch of Swift processes out there. I've got, you know, container services, I've got account services, I've got object services. Well, and there's lots of them, not just one. Well, if you get the data from Collecto, you can add up all the numbers and see how much time did I spend in each one of these processes. And again, Eamon's going to show some more details on that. And then there's another tool that we use from time to time called Callplot that lets us plot the data that Collecto generates. But the main thing I wanted to talk about is, is this uh, benchmarking tool that I wrote that, for lack of a better name, I call it GetPut Tools. And what GetPut does is it, um, it's, it's specifically for Swift benchmarking. And what it does is it's got lots of switches and lots of options because, like I said, I'm interested in seeing what's going wrong, not what's going right, so that I can help figure out how to make things go better. So on, on the one level, it lets you say whether you want to do puts, gets, or deletes, what kind of object sizes you want to write, you know, how many client, you can say how many clients are going to be running the tests in parallel. Um, you might want to run multi-threads on each client, so this will let you do that. And, and it also allows you to talk about container sharing, because this is kind of an interesting one. If you're, um, 
you could have you know, 20 clients with 100 threads and they're all writing to the same container, or you could have 20 clients with 100 threads writing to different containers, and, th and that can have an impact on the way the performance works. There's also some options for, um, for how you want to run, run the tests, and um, that, uh, that means that you can actually say, instead of just running a test for 1K object, I want to run it for 1K, 2K, 4K, 8K, 6K, and, and just do all in a single run. So that's kind of a neat, a neat thing to do. And um, the other thing that's, that's interesting is you can have pre and post test processing so that you can then go analyze the data as you're collecting it from, from individual tests. And again, there's a lot more switches. It's way beyond the scope of this presentation. Um, but you're certainly welcome to get a copy and play with it and, and see what you see. There's, you know, there's documentation, there's a man page, help, all the usual stuff. So getting started with using this tool, and I, I don't know, I, I hope people can read some of this stuff. But the main thing to know about get, get put is it's using the uh, Python Swift client library that's part of, that's part of the Swift. And um, you need credentials to talk to Swift. So that's the one, the one thing that can sometimes be tricky is you need to set up your environment with your Swift credentials. And what I always do is I just run the Swift stack command. And if the Swift, if the Swift stack command works, then get put's going to work. And if the Swift, Swift stack command doesn't work, then get put probably isn't going to work. So at the very, very top, I just wanted to show a real quick um, example of a, of a get put run. And this is pretty boring, actually. Um, if you can read it, what it's, what it's doing is it's simply writing a single 1K object. And it's doing a put, a get, and a delete. And then if you read horizontally across the top of the line, it will tell you how long the test took, how many objects it, it, it did, how many IOPS, what the megabytes were. And the really interesting column is the one on the far right that for this test is kind of boring. And that tells you the latency range. Because a lot of times people will run a test and say the latency was, you know, 0.08. And I say, well, gee, 0.08. Were all the puts 0.08? Were some of them 0.01? Were some of them 0.8? Were some of them 0.6? This at least tells you, gives you an idea of the range of the latencies. There's even more switches that'll let you print out a latency histogram, but it wouldn't fit on the screen, and I'm trying to keep this relatively short. One of the really interesting things that I was able to find with this tool is if you look at the bottom where it's circled, and again, I'm hoping people can read this, I kind of discovered that quite accidentally that, again, took me in a different direction during my testing, which happens all the time. You keep getting surprised. But what I found was a 2K put was actually two or three times faster than a 1K put. And my very first thought was I must have a bug in my code, but I did a lot of experimenting. I ran it on a lot of different test clusters. I started getting involved in playing with TCP dump and S trace and all kinds of crazy stuff. And I finally found out it was one of these buffer alignment issues. And I don't know how many people are familiar with the Nagel algorithm, but it's at the lower levels of TCP. And what happens with Nagel is depending on your packet sizes, the, the client might think that there's another packet, so it delays its ACK. And when the Nagel algorithm kicks in at the right point, which in this case was a one kilobyte object, it adds a delay, and that's causing the one kilobyte objects to run slow. So short, the real short story is I worked with the, with, uh, the Swift core team, managed to, and they got the client fixed so that it no longer does this. So this is actually running with an older Swift client, but I'm using it just as a, to demonstrate. If you were to run it with the current Swift client version two, you'll see that there's no long, it no longer behaves that way. This I just really wanted to quickly give you an example of the kind of data that Collectal will report. And here I'm doing a one, I'm doing like a 500 megabyte put, I think. I can't really read it from here. It, or no, it's a one gigabyte put. And, and basically you're seeing the get put is reporting that it did something like 77 or 78 megabytes a second. But if you take a look at the column, and yeah, I didn't get my updated slides to aim, and I just discovered yesterday I circled the wrong column. It's actually one column to the right. It's, uh, it's, it's actually this column over here. And if you take a look, what you can see is not every single second are you doing 78 megabytes. Sometimes it goes up to 90, sometimes it goes down to you know 40 or 50. And the other important thing to notice is before the test started, the traffic was close to zero. 
Again, if you're running this on a cluster and there are other people talking to Swift from, or, or there's other people doing network stuff on your client, it's gonna, it's gonna mess up your test. So it's really important to see you know, what your system's doing before the test starts and then watch the behavior. And if you happen to see during the test that you're having some really you know, short valleys inside the data, then you know, perhaps you know, there's uh, switch problems or network problems or who knows what kind of problems. So this is kind of like looking at running a benchmark. And in this case, what we're doing, if you look at the, uh, the three columns on the left, it's telling you how many clients you were running the test on. And in this case, it was a single client. You're looking at um, how many processes were running from that single client. So in this single client, we're running from one to 48 processes. And we're running them all with one kilobyte objects. And this thing, to, and, and if you look at the, the timings and stuff, you can see that they were, uh, I believe they were two minute long tests. And now you can actually start seeing the number of operations were, you know, more than just one. But more importantly, if you look at the right hand side again for the latency range, you can see that on most of the tests, the latency range was relatively narrow. So that means most of the operations were falling in a relatively narrow band which is a good thing. Every once in a while, you'll see a latency range going up to one. And when it does that, it's kind of sort of telling you that, hey, something, you know, at least one of these operations took a lot longer than it should have taken. And that's kind of like a red flag that says, you know, maybe there's a problem with your Swift environment. Again, these were all on, uh, this was all done on these development clusters, so I wish I could remember what all the settings and things were, but quite honestly, I don't. This last slide is an example of um, what happens when things go wrong. This is an example of running um, up to uh, 1,000 threads on eight clients. So I think each client was running 128 threads. And that's really, that's really pushing the hell out of it. And um, the important thing, really, is if you take a look at those two circled columns, the first one being the IOPS and the second being the latency range. If you look at the lower numbers, you can see, yeah, the IOPS, they're kind of scaling. You know, here's what they're doing at one client, here's what they're doing at, you know, 16 or 30, here's what 32 clients are doing, um, th 32 threads, I should say. And yeah, it's kind of scaling, it's going up really nicely. But geez, once you start getting up into, you know, the upper ends, you can see, wow, we've really maxed out. Um, in fact, those last two, the, the number barely changed at all, and the one right before it was pretty close to it as well. But the thing that gets really scary is when you look at the latency range, because on, um, on the last two ones, we're having latencies, what's that, like 300 seconds or something like that, which is like totally insane. And when you think about benchmarking, what really happens with a benchmark, you do X number of puts over Y number of seconds, and you divide the two. Well. If, if one of the latencies is 300 seconds, you've like totally blown, you know, your numbers. So you really want to look at the latencies in conjunction with the um, number of operations to try to figure out exactly what's going on. And um, I think that's pretty much what I wanted to cover with you guys. Um, I, guess, I guess we have a couple of minutes. If anybody had a quick question, or I could just hand the mic over to uh, Eamon. Yes? Pardon? I'm not sure what the, a, a copy of get put. It's on the last slide. Okay. Yes, sir. To be honest, I haven't. You know, there's, there's a lot of, there, there, there's several really cool Swift benchmarking tools. I'm familiar with Cosbench. I'm, con, I'm familiar with SSBench. Um, I haven't dug really deep into them, but, you know, part of my, um, goal with, with the whole get put thing is to be able to do some diagnostics and okay, well it, it, it sounds like something we could, we could certainly talk about later all right I, one last question because I want to make sure Amy gets enough time okay um, I'm not sure this is beyond the scope of what you guys are doing but one of the things I'd be concerned about is if I have a <clears throat> something that's a, a, a process that's writing a Swift object, another process that wants to read it. Um, with the way most Swift 
uh, installations are set up, I think, with, with <clears throat> the number of rights in the region to be eventual consistent, I would be concerned of knowing, is there a way for me to measure you know, what the statistical bound on the consistency would be? So just writing and reading objects as fast as possible, that's great, but what about the actual <clears throat> consistency of the objects and knowing that, like, you know, if I, on the average in this load, if I read between, you know, if, if I write this many objects per second, I'm trying to read them, am I gonna hit a point where I'm gonna get inconsistencies because everything's hashing and not settled out yet? So I'm wondering if, how, you, how we might be able to address that. Yeah, that, that, that's definitely getting complicated. What, 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 my, what I've done with, this, with my particular sets of tests is I do a bunch of puts and then I read them all back. I haven't done any tests where one, one process is trying to put while the other process is trying to read, um, primarily because the other process doesn't, it, it, it's kind of hard to synchronize. You can't do your read until the, until the write finished. But again, it's, it's kind of beyond the scope of this talk, but it might be something to discuss maybe at the developer summit. You know, I'm gonna be talking some more about this stuff on Friday. But I think I should sit down and give Eamon the mic. Okay, thanks, Mark. Um, so, we're now going to just talk about some results that we collected um, on um, a couple of configurations that we tested um, with Swift. And the objective of these measurements was, I suppose, um, just to get a better understanding of how Swift runs um, on particular hardware and how you can optimize the combination of Swift and hardware to get the best performance. The two different configurations that we're going to talk about um, first configuration has 12 disk data servers with dedicated proxy servers. And those data servers run all the, um, the object uh, container and, and account services. And um, we deploy those uh, data servers in the ratio of about five data servers to one proxy server. The second configuration, uh, we have 60 disk data servers. And those data servers run just the object services, don't run the container or account services. They're run on separate servers. Um, and the um, ratio of data servers, object data servers, to proxy servers in that configuration is about one to one. Um, we, we didn't try to uh, cover the entire spectrum of uh, behavior and, and performance measurements of Swift. We concentrated on small objects um, in the initial case mainly because looking at the distribution of object sizes in our production systems, most of them are quite small, 50% um, less than 20 kilobytes in size. <clears throat> um, and um, uh, we looked at particularly puts of those small objects. So we're just looking at the transaction rate, basically, um, as you try to put more and more objects, um, small objects onto a cluster. Um, and this is the first configuration. Um, the proxy servers have uh, 12 physical cores, 24 virtual cores that they hyperthread, 96 gigs of RAM, uh, 10 gig e network interface, uh, mirrored disk for availability of operating system primarily. And the servers are half U wide, so they're uh, one U high, half U wide. The data servers themselves um, have 12 disks, 12, ter ter 12 two terabyte disks in this case. Those disks uh, spin at 7200 RPM. A uh, single gig, one giggy interface, um, and 24 gigs of RAM. Um, and as I said, these servers run all the object container and account services. Um, one of the first things we noticed um, on our production systems, and these measurements are actually on a development system, um, was that I idle systems, by idle I mean that we're not actually doing any external puts, gets or deletes or anything on, on the system still seem to be quite busy CPU-wise. So there seems to be a lot of things going on. So um, what we did was we um, took uh, this particular configuration here. Um, each server has about 100,000 containers and about 20 million objects. Um, and we selectively turned on and off different um, Swift processes. So um, the far left uh, column there is with the object and container servers alone running. Uh, account is, isn't really important. It, it's, for, it's minimal, uh, almost immeasurable in terms of CPU activity. Um, the green part there is the container sync servers that was running across all these tests. Uh, then we turned on the, the auditors. Um, we turned the auditors off. We turned on the updaters. And then finally, we turned off the auditors and updaters and turned on the 
replicators. And you'll see there's a fairly major jump in CPU usage with replicators turned on. And that's, that's the container replication. Uh, so what's happening is the container replication process itself is consuming CPU, but it's also imposing a load on the container service itself. Um, so, um, you, you know, we've, the CPU load is measured in terms of CPU cores. So um, on this 12 physical core system, we're seeing, you know, around four cores or so um, being burned, just maintaining the system health, basically, which is, which is very significant. Um, now on to uh, actual measurements which are impo with an imposed load. So these are for one kilobyte object puts on the same system. And these are CPU measurements on the data server. Um, we didn't really look in detail at, at the proxy server for these runs. Uh, we did for the second configuration. Um, and um, what you'll notice is that, again, most of the CPU load here is the container service and container replication. Um, the, um, you'll see that we start again with a fairly high idle, effectively, or quite a CPU load of four cores. It goes up to about five cores. It doesn't go beyond that, so you've got a fairly narrow band um, of CPU usage, and that's at the maximum obtainable put rate that we could get with that configuration, which is about 340 or so, actually, no, three, no, 340 um, puts per second. We max out at about five CPUs in use on the data servers. Um, the object servers themselves don't use a huge amount of CPU, but it does grow linearly as you increase the put rate, although you can't tell from this graph. Um, on, on the I.O. side, um, if you look at the, the writes that we see, um, again, graphing it by put rate for different processes, you see that the container and the object are doing most of the writing. However, the high C, highest I.O. load is actually on the read side, not the write side. So um, this is the lower graph on the left-hand side. The, um, the process that consumes most of the, the reads uh, is the auditor, the object auditor, which is something who runs to be quite familiar with. Um, the object server itself, though, as you increase the put rate, starts to read quite a bit. As it, it turns out, it's actually reading about six times as much as it, as it writes uh, for these, this object size. Um, what happens um, on, on the servers is that all of those reads are coming from disk and not from cache, um, so, which is, is not good. So you're seeing a lot of disk activity just to satisfy the reads on the server. Um, so just some observations, just summarizing what I said there. There's a fairly high idle CPU burn. The CPU burn doesn't increase ahead of it all, actually, as you get to the maximum on the data server side. Um, container services are the major CPU hog. Um, the small amount of memory and the fact that we're running the container and object services together definitely is hurting our performance. Um, the container data and, uh, and object data are conflicting in cache and wiping each other out in cache. Um, and we're also seeing that the, uh, the reads um, on the object side, even for puts, um, seem to be the major um, major performance limiter. Um, so that this is a bit of a surprise to us to see that we've been limited by read in, in this configuration, not so much by, by write. Um, the other thing that, that uh, we quickly concluded from, from these measurements is that we better to keep the container and object services separate, that they, they don't sit well together on, on a server. Um, the, the object services themselves consume very little CPU. Um, it's mainly the, the, um, uh, the container services. And also, it, it did seem that uh, increasing the amount of RAM for buffer cache would, would have a positive effect on performance. So this is the second configuration that we tested. Um, we have um, two types of server in this configuration. We've got proxy and container account servers, um, both of the same type in terms of hardware. Um, those servers have four disks. This configuration, those disks are reasonably slow. The one gigabyte, sorry, one terabyte, 7200 RPM drives. Um, we tested a variety of RAID configurations with this, um, but uh, it, uh, for these tests, it didn't make any difference. But um, we, uh, we, we need to go back and revisit those those uh, tests. A 10 gig e interface, um, either 96 or 192 gigabytes of RAM. I get onto that in a second. And again, the same half u wide, one u high server. The object servers themselves um, um, have 60 disks of three, actually 
this is a mistake here, it should be three terabytes. Um, 96 gigs of RAM and again 12 cores. Now we, we looked at a lot of different config combinations of, um, of server and running services on those server uh, in, in different combinations. I'm not going to talk about all the measurements we made. Um, I'm going to concentrate on one particular combination, which is where we ran the container and account services on the same node as the proxy services. Um, so in that configuration, we have one server that's running our proxy services, our container and account services, one server running our object uh, services, and that's the ratio, one to one. Um, In terms of this, this what happens on, on the CPU side, um, we have two graphs here, uh, one for the object server, one for the proxy server. Um, again, looking at the number of cores that are being used uh, as, as you increase the, the put rate. Um, first thing to notice is that the put rate we can achieve here is much higher than it was on the previous configuration. We're getting up to, uh, in, in this measurement here, four kilobyte objects, 2,000 puts per second. There's a, a pretty extreme bump in CPU usage at, at 2,000. Um, it looks sort of anomalous, but it is reproducible. So we get this consistently as we run these tests. We don't understand why we see that, that, that jump in CPU usage, on, particularly on the, on the object server side at 2,000 puts per second. Um, the idle CPU burn is less. It's about two cores compared to the previous configuration because these configurations are pristine. There's no data on them before we start doing the measurements. Um, on the proxy side, you see that there is um, a reasonably even balance between the, the proxy and the container um, CPU burns. Um, and the combined uh, CPU load of both services is actually less than the object service load on the object server. Um, when you look at the, the reads on the object uh, server, com compared to the previous configuration where we saw all reads coming from disk, they're now all coming, coming from cache. Um, so a complete flip of, of, of the behavior we saw on the first configuration. Um, so again, summarizing the observations, um, we see a much higher maximum put throughput for this configuration, up to 2,000 puts per second with four kilobyte objects and up to about 1,600 puts per second with one kilobyte objects. And uh, we do see that dramatic jump in CPU usage um, Going from, going from 1,600 puts per second, roughly up to 2,000 puts per second on the, on the object server side. Don't understand what's going on there, really. We haven't looked in, in great detail at that. Um, but if you look at the number of cores you're using, you really are benefiting from hyper-threading. Um, you go well beyond the number of physical cores you have, which is interesting. Um, on the proxy uh, slash account container server side, the major CPU users are, again, the container and proxy services. The account service really is almost immeasurable. Um, and finally, compared to the first configuration, um, those troublesome reads that we saw on the object server side now are coming from the um, from cache as opposed to from the disks themselves. Um, so that translates into a much higher um, transaction rate achieved about five times per five times the first configuration per U of rack space uh, when you work it out. Um, it also turns out that the proxy services and the account container service can coexist quite happily, which was um, something that was a, a nice surprise to get, actually. Um, it, what, it, what that seems to imply is that um, you don't need to have a separate server just for account and container services. You can actually combine it with a proxy server and cut down on the, um, the amount of servers you have in your configuration. Um, one issue with this configuration, um, potentially, is object auditing. So um, the object auditor uh, running on a reasonably full, let's say, let's say full, say 70% um, uh, full um, uh, object server would take about 200 days or so to run, which is just too long. And you don't really want to bump up the uh, default parameters of the auditor to make it consume more I.O. because it's already doing enough of that. Um, so um, one possible solution to that problem is to parallelize the auditor so that instead of auditing one disk at a time, which is the way it works right now, you audit multiple disks in parallel. So we made that change, and it's up for review. Um, and 
the measurements I've just presented were quite specific, um, a specific use case. Um, we want to go back and revisit that uh, a couple of ways. Um, uh, these are just two of them. Um, look at the object auditor itself uh, in detail running on a reasonably full um, uh, configuration two where you've got the 60 disks on, on the data server and see how it behaves, particularly if you've got multiple parallel um, auditing streams running simultaneously. Um, and the second, th the second thing would be to look at large containers. The containers that we use in these tests are actually quite small. Um, and anyone who's used Swift, I think, uh, is probably quite familiar with the fact that uh, large container performance can be an issue. Um, so you want to go back and, and visit that. Uh, not, instead of using Stripe disks on the, uh, for the proxy and container services to use SSDs, for instance, and see how that, uh, how that affects performance. And Mark mentioned that there are some links. And here they are. So you can get collectible and get put um, at these locations. And uh, that's it. Um, are there any questions? What was the difference between what? Um, the disk layout. Oh, um, yeah. The well, the um, you mean in terms of cache and so on? Oh, one one I/O one controller, um, basically. Your results were normalized per object server, so that was 2,000 puts per second per yeah. object server. Any idea how this scales as you go to like 10, 20 object servers? Yeah. Um, no, we haven't measured. <coughs> excuse me, we haven't measured that. We expect it to scale linearly, but that assumes that you've got a workload that again will scale linearly, that will you know parallelize correctly. Swift does tend to, um, within the limits of, of how it scales, scales pretty well. Um, which is a nice feature of Swift. Uh, why was the objects per second on 4KB objects higher than 1KB objects? Is it ah, you, you weren't listening to my presentation. OK, so is it the same issue? We were, no, it wasn't the same machine, but it was the same older version of the Swift client. These tests were run a while back, okay. and they just recently got version 2 out. So that's why 4 was faster than 1. <laughs> Yep. See, you looked at the data and you noticed. Yep. Good for you. <laughs> uh, if we had the hardware, yes, we just didn't, didn't have the hardware to test. So, yeah, we, we would. Uh, at what point did you run into single container bottlenecks? Like, at what point, um, after how many objects did you start seeing a lower performance on a single container? Uh, you mean when the when the container became a, a the bottleneck? Is that what you're talking about? Yeah, yeah. Um, Puts on a, like creates on a single container. Well, um, so basically, the, at at the peak, um, if you go beyond that point, it'll it might saturate for a while, but it'll tend to tail off eventually. So you you start to come down in performance. So. Um, the, the, peak, the peak rates that I showed there were basically the, the points at which the container service was fully subscribed in that sense. And going beyond that, you were going to, you know, So that 17 million it. objects? Is that what it was? Sorry? Was that 17 million objects? Oh, uh, sorry. The, um, yeah, so the, uh, the first configuration, um, each, serv each server had about uh, 100,000 containers and 17 million objects. So. I've, well, that's, that's not very many objects per container. Um, on the second test, the system was pristine. It was clean, completely clean. So we just created containers in the fly. So we didn't actually have very many. Uh, we, haven't, we need to go back and redo those tests where we've got actually existing containers in the system and then start running um, get put. Because it definitely will, it will affect performance. But we still expect to see that the performance of the second configuration would be much better than the performance of the first configuration.
um, just give, given what we saw um, as bottlenecks in the first configuration that seem to have been fixed in the second configuration, I think that's still going to be the case. When you, tur when you turn, in, turn on the replication, you, you spike the, your CPU spike four yeah. core, right? Yeah. So is it locally replication or are you running remote? Oh, I think we have to, oh, could answer your certain answer that question. Um, no, it, it, that, that's, that's per server, so there's actually multiple data servers in that configuration. So it's not local, it's actually, you know, across the entire Swift cluster, measured on one server, one particular server. Oh, okay. Yep. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you.